Episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show, bringing you another fascinating guest today who is uh, literally going to... Uh, creating a better tomorrow for, for billions of people around this planet. It's really fascinating set of technologies. Um, today, we have the honor of being joined by Dr. David Soup, uh, who is Chief Executive Officer and co-founder of a company called Asmosic. Uh, a fascinating organization that is uh, so-called re-architecting wireless connectivity solutions uh, from the ground up, ultimately to radically reduce uh, Internet of Things device dependent on batteries, aiming to make batteries technically last forever, uh, and the Internet of Things battery free one day, ultimately breaking the, uh, the power battery to uh, a widespread adoption of IoT. Uh, David brings uh, to Atmosic over 30 years of engineering expertise with a really extensive wireless background. His past teams, uh, radio designs have brought billions of successful devices to market. Uh, David was on the, the early engineering team at Atheros as vice president of analog radio frequency engineering, also as vice president of engineering with Qualcomm uh, for several years following uh, the 2011 acquisition of Atheros. Uh, David was also at HP for several years. Uh, David has uh, both a master's and his bachelor's in electrical engineering from University of Tennessee, did his PhD in electrical engineering from Stanford, where he served as a, a consulting professor of electrical engineering for several years, and David is also uh, an Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers Fellow, and we are quite honored to have him with us today. Um, Dr. David Sue, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. Thanks so much for the introduction, and thanks for the opportunity. It's, it's really great to have you, David, and I'd like to start off, um, as we have typically been doing, by handing you uh, the microphone for a little bit, just to talk a little bit more and introduce yourself because obviously you, you have a passion from a, obviously a very a young age of all things electrical engineering. Take us back to sort of the early story about Dr. David Sue, where you grew up, when you developed these interests, and a little bit of the early career journey that got you thinking of, hey, you know, a, a battery-free Internet of Things would be really cool to have one day. Sure, sure. Uh, I, I guess personal life stories the way I look at it is always a sequence of events, big or small, and coincidences that led us to where we are today. And uh, looking back in life, there is always uh, very interesting of choices we made. Some choices that led to big changes and pivot in our career, for example. So in my case, I would say the biggest change in my career is probably leaving the comfort of HP Labs, where I was uh, working on CMOS wireless in the early days, to join a small startup, as you uh, pointed out earlier, Atheros, working on Wi-Fi. So that happened about some 20 years ago. So that, in my mind, is probably the one decision that I made as a young engineer that led me to the subsequent career path I had so far. So in many cases, it sort of forced me to stretch myself in areas that are uncomfortable, uh, mind you. Uh, and uh, in many cases, it worked out for the better. So I joined Atheros in 99. Uh, the, I like to claim that I was the first person to join after initial funding. So as I walk in the door, you have the founding team, the founder, and the rest of the engineering team. And I would say I was the only employee. <laughs> uh, and that was quite an experience. There was a, a front row seat to see how a company grow from an early stage as you go through the scaling stage 
to now be a profitable, well-run company going IPO. And we ran as independent company for a long time. I can't remember exactly now, maybe 10 years or so. And eventually got uh, acquired by Qualcomm. So, uh, and having the experience of bringing, as you know, Wi-Fi back then was the early stages to now everywhere you go, you see Wi-Fi. I, I think the first sign that I knew this is big is when you go on vacation, hotels will advertise we have Wi-Fi. So, oh, yeah. we work on Wi-Fi. So, so in many ways, I was very fortunate to have the uh, opportunity to work closely with a team in a technology that was gaining traction across. So, so that, that's been the way I look at it is a adventure of a lifetime. And so then that led me to essentially meeting up with co-founders many years later to start on Amazon. Awesome. Awesome. And, and you know, too, we, we've talked a bit uh, on previous shows about Internet of Things in general. It touched on sort of edge computing a little bit. And so, you know, we have this general understanding, a uh, layperson understanding, let me say, and we have this network of uh, physical things out there, sensors and software and, and a variety of other technologies. Um, and then, you know, the area you're working in is sort of the Internet of Things on a much grander scale. In, in a sense, there's a lot of stuff out there that we technically can connect um, wirelessly, as you're just mentioning. Um, and there are these two areas, battery life and power management that are these extreme hurdles that um, if somebody really smart like yourself was to solve these, um, it really represents a, a sort of a holy grail concept of whether we call it battery free, forever battery, what have you. Could you sort of give us an outline about sort of what the current system looks like and sort of where the limitations are for some of us that are less familiar with the, the grander scheme or the picture of Internet of Things. We'll get into low power solutions, energy harvesting, and so of that in a little bit. Talk a little bit just about the overall picture so we can get a really an idea for what Atmosix sort of playground is, let's say. Sure, sure. I'll, I'll just look at a bigger picture for a bit about at least my view of how this IoT uh, works. The way I look at it is that we have devices around us forever. Uh, and, and that's nothing new. The, the, the main difference we have now is that you have the ability to do a fair amount of computation locally without taking a lot of energy. And the bigger change in my mind is that you can connect everything to everything. Now, you have this massive mind of people refer to as cloud AI uh, that can now make all of these devices work in a seamless manner around you. And, and so, so the, the net result is, in many cases, magical. Things that used to be impossible, now is possible. So to me, there are several pieces. One is you need the endpoint devices, make it as intelligent or as much computation as you could, given your battery power constraint. Now you need this link to the central or cloud intelligence that you can now do almost infinite amount of computation. And then repeat that billions of times around. So the pieces to my mind is that the endpoint is important, the link is very important, and then the central piece is also very important. And what a mouse plays is the endpoint and the link. Yeah. And coming to as Masik now, the you know, there are these two terms that um, are, are used when I go through sort of your materials and your website, low powered solutions, and also energy harvesting. Talk a little bit, once again, for us to sort of lay people here, what that exactly means. Sure. I, I would actually step back a bit. And at the early days of company, we're debating what can we do and what can we do that's meaningful. So there are two things, what, what we can, are able to do and what we do that is meaningful. So the combination of the two. Sure. So our team background essentially is wireless communications. We've been doing that for a long time. And, uh, and uh, half jokingly in the early days, we were saying we are partially to blame in many <laughs> cases because by having wireless communication, you now no longer need data cable everywhere. And now you took away the cable, it's very hard to say, by the way, keep that power cord on. So, so you are naturally encouraging everybody to put batteries in everywhere so you can carry everywhere you go. Or even simple things like door sensors that you put on your door, you don't want to want to wire to that thing. 
now put a battery in it. And the net result essentially is now you have all these batteries around that, that we end up spending a fair amount of uh, uh, resources on. So, so the number is actually very high. Uh, the last EPA estimate is probably, I would say, five, six years ago. That says in the U.S., we are throwing away 3 billion batteries a year. Mm. So by my quick math, that's 100 batteries a second. Uh, so the, to me, that's astounding. If you can now just re enhance the battery life, reduce power consumption, enhance the battery life by 2x, which is reduce the amount of battery we throw away by half. I, I think the appetite for growing back, uh, using batteries is not going to stop anytime soon. But if you can just reduce the usage, then it will become much more sustainable. So that's the first piece of that. And then harvesting is a second piece of the puzzle in my mind. Energy harvesting has been around forever. And, and uh, uh, some of it, when technology works well, we don't even think of it as anything interesting. So I'll give you two examples. I have a watch that doesn't require battery change because it's got a tiny solar panel on top of it. Uh, so, uh, and, and uh, mechanical harvesting on watches has been on for ages, for example. And then a more recent phenomenon is uh, calculators. Calculators now, at least the up to the mid-range calculators, uh, I was shopping for a calculator for my, my kids when they were younger. Uh, and uh, I was just shocked that every calculator I see has a little solar panel on it. Mm -hmm. And I had to open them up to just see what's going on. But <laughs> more or less, calculators now run off the energy from the solar panel. So that transition has happened without much notice by the whole world. So. So I'm just saying, harvesting is around. We, okay. we are leveraging it across. The piece that we add now to it is the connectivity and the end computation piece for IoT. That if you bring the power consumption down low enough, then now it makes sense to be able to obtain enough energy from around you mm -hmm. on purpose or ambient uh, and to power the device to either extend the battery life to make it much longer, or in some cases, battery free. So that is, uh, in our mind, that will help that IoT growth to be much more meaningful. Outstanding. And so, David, we've, uh, on the show, we, we do uh, quite a bit um, in the area of healthcare, and, um, you know, the, the themes of well, these novel health-related applications, connected health-related applications are have been so, in the last couple of years, so extremely exciting, especially with all of us uh, working in virtual mode and so forth. But obviously, healthcare systems uh, don't you know, haven't always had that luxury, but nonetheless, um, there's been several applications uh, of connected health uh, mentioned in the press recently related to Asmosic. And, you know, I'd love if you could just talk through a couple of these. One uh, had to do with some press related to uh, continuous glucose monitoring systems, extremely important uh, for our diabetic uh, patients. And, and this is an area that we've, we've done for quite a few shows on. Um, also, you know, uh, contract tracing <laughs> has been a very hot topic the last couple of years, but specifically uh, this article that I read was uh, focusing on uh, the elderly and the sort of, um, uh, we got into the theme of uh, aging in place, uh, uh, the smart home, the smart healthcare, and so forth. Take us a little bit, you can walk us through both of these topics, because I think they're both very relevant to themes that we touched on the show, but extremely relevant to what's going on in the healthcare space in 2022. Yeah, I, I think I, I look at healthcare as just another piece of the puzzle for this IoT growth. Yeah. There, there's definitely the need for sensing. There are so many sensing we could do uh, with smart watches, which unfortunately I don't have to. I'm on a, I got a traditional dumb watch. Me either. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you, 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 can, you can imagine all the sensing you could do. Yeah. And uh, the sensing, as I mentioned earlier, without the connectivity really doesn't give you the intelligence you want to need, you would want to have to your central cloud usage. You mentioned continuous glucose monitor is one case whereby where the, the battery operation, now there are two pieces to the puzzle. We can, depend on what your lifetime limit of the application is, you can now make the battery life much longer or you can make your form factor much, much smaller. And both cases will reduce the, what, what I would consider the waste 
associated with the application. Mm -hmm. the, and then with the longer range communication, you can now, instead of having to take your monitor and tap, you can potentially do it continuously and, and uh, with being less intrusive. Uh, continuous glucose monitors one, but you can imagine that extension to when you are in a hospital, the care for you uh, from anything ranging from your pulse, your oxygen level to temperature and so forth. You can now do all that continuously without needing this huge amount of overhead associated with continuous battery changes and so forth. That's in a more hospital setting. And then you move, you touch on elder care, which is one of those things. Uh, one thing for certain for all of us is we are not getting any younger. We are all getting older. And and uh, it's, it's uh, I mean, many of us have gone through the cases with parents whereby you do, yeah. would like to have a chance to monitor them when you can't be with them 24-7. Yeah. And having that connected uh, ability is very helpful. So, so there's a continuous uh, level for the elderly. But I will fast forward more to the general population as well, yep. that, that it, there's a lot of monitoring you could do. And then in the specific case of uh, COVID, uh, we, we, as, especially at early stages, uh, we, we did participate in the, the desire for contact tracing and uh, especially in uh, events whereby you have a lot of people in close proximity. Because as you know, contact tracing, the more refined you are, the less intrusive you can be. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, so instead of saying that this large group of people now needs to be quarantined, now you can reduce it by a much smaller subset. So, so, so we, we, we do that with a, a sports event, for example. We also uh, work closely with cruise ship and so forth in those applications as well. And, and with the goal primarily is to reduce the number of quarantine. You don't quarantine the whole ship. You cannot quarantine <laughs> the, the individual that could actually be uh, in, in uh, close contact. So, so once again, it's the ability to have low power and connectivity and use it in an intelligent manner to, mm -hmm. to help all of us. And, you know, moving from the, uh, the healthcare uh, domain and sort of the personalization, uh, the wearables and that, uh, to the industrial side now, I know you've been active in um, manufacturing uh, settings, active in retail. Obviously, this is an area that, um, and we'll, I'll bring the, the, the smart concept in again, smart, uh, low energy, green. Um, one of the areas that we touched on a little bit uh, in terms of manufacturing on a few episodes is this whole sort of digital twinning. And, you know, let's not put all the energy into this yet until we uh, have our uh, factory floor planned out digitally and so forth um, as, as one type of solution. Talk a little bit about how you see some of these, uh, these low powered solutions uh, affecting sort of the industrial landscape a bit, if you will. I think in a lot of industrial application or industrial enterprise application, there's definitely a lot of desire to do uh, intelligent things, simple things from tracking, uh, uh, we, we, were, we were told that, talking to one of the hospital, just the fact that where is everything? Where is your piece of equipment? Just knowing the utilization, knowing where things are makes a big difference for that. So, so that could be uh, in the factory floor whereby you have pieces of equipment. And then the other thing would be, do you monitor equipment so that to know that equipment is uh, now in need of some maintenance, you can do it earlier based on your sensing and so forth. All of these cases, once again, comes down to a sensor and you need to some local computation and then having a link that is convenient is of running wire everywhere, right? wirelessly, and then back to a central uh, AI computation that you can now analyze and maintain. And so, so from the, we are solving the two pieces of, in my mind, the two of the three puzzle, there's a lot of companies focus on the AI cloud computation piece of it. We right. focus on how can we give you the much lower uh, robust link uh, without needing this amount of battery you need to have in your local link. And in many cases, harvesting can make a lot of sense. Yep. Vibration, light, temperature deltas, uh, motion uh, can all come in. And uh, in some cases, you can put dedicated RF sources. So we, we have, for example, working closely with partners such as Energis, working with the Industrial Alliance, the uh, Airfield Alliance, for example, that just recently introduced a uh, industry standard 
uh, to allow uh, devices to interoperate. So creating an ecosystem whereby uh, you don't have to rely on one company for the entire proprietary solution. You can you can uh, miss a match. You can choose from us or someone else that is a partner in the same alliance. Um, then once you have that interoperability, then you have much more higher confidence that you are not relying purely on one company and and uh, being completely uh, relying on one person as well. So 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 that ecosystem build up will definitely help the overall uh, growth in the industrial space in particular. And, and moving from um, the industrial space, and another little piece I read about your materials is just once again this the smart city concept. And and you know we've we've had the opportunity to talk to uh, groups like Microsoft that uh, you know have their feet in the the, the smart city domain. We talked to some people from uh, over in Saudi Arabia where they're building <laughs> smart cities in the middle of the desert. Um, just take us through some of the visions of, of where potentially Atmos it could play uh, in the space as well. They're sort of building some of these yeah. sort of unique uh, ecosystems from the ground up. So, so some, some of it can be very fascinating in terms of, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll start with a comment that, that uh, I'm sure uh, you, you'll remember. Remember the story of uh, the Arabian Nights with Alibaba? Uh, yep. Not a company. I mean the actual story. No, the actual uh, book. Yeah, I have it. <laughs> actual story uh, with the open sesame concept. Yeah. Right. Uh, uh, my 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 thought always is that if you talk to a young person today about that story, they will say, "So what's 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 so magical about it?" That's just Alexa. <laughs> so <laughs> so you can see, smart city is one case whereby a lot of fascinating things can happen from your digital presence, sensing who you are. And uh, being able to unlock doors. Imagine you you walk into a, your future hotel, and you already made the reservation. You walk in the front door; they know exactly who you are. Uh, as you walk in front door, the front desk will greet you. Good morning, Ara. Uh, welcome back. Uh, and so, so you can imagine a smooth transition of checking in, just going to your room, and that can extend to the to a, uh, a citywide uh, use case use cases whereby. Uh, from your digital identity to just being able for, to be fully integrated with the entire ecosystem, ranging from smart meters in your home, which, which we are also working with people on, and uh, allowing the entire infrastructure that the city has to provide to be all interconnected. So, so on the smart city side, as I say, almost the sky's the limit. We do have to watch one thing that, that we are very passionate about making sure that you have provide enough security, authentication, making sure that the only things that you approve of are the one that you can grant people access. Like, because on a city scale, you can almost imagine True. if you just do it w without the right uh, security authentication around the whole subject matter, uh, you can get people turned off very quickly. But, but the use case we are providing essentially is you, you don't have to worry so much about my smart city will work for six months because six months later, all oh, my battery's dead. My stadium now works very well for six months. And then later on, all my beacons are now dead. And I need to hire someone to go in on ladders to change my <laughs> every one of my beacons around. So that becomes a deal breaker for just about any installation. Sure. And, and, and this is one example whereby we think the maintenance of batteries become critical for a sustainable launch. And uh, this is where we can add that. Absolutely. Um, David, I, I think I, mean, I read, maybe it was last year, you, you had raised about $50 million uh, today, but then I saw, saw something recently, uh, something about 72 more. So I, I know you're, you're, doing, you're being very successful with your investors and, and, and building this a lot. Just talk a little bit about, um, a little bit about sort of how that's all going since you started up, obviously. <laughs> you have a great investor team uh, there, um, and, and this is definitely uh, uh, something that has not been difficult for you to <laughs> to put together and grow. And then any um, other partnerships um, that you can talk about for 2022, um, there's nothing confidential, but things that are uh, going to be announced or any, any scoops you can give on the show or things that were recently announced. Um, but love to hear what you, you're envisioning happening uh, in the coming months. Yeah, yeah. I, I think we all know that for a startup company, one of the most important thing we need essentially is to have 
uh, investors that are support. Right. Uh, you, you, you need a vision, you need a team, but we actually need investment to actually execute the plan. Uh, from that point of view, Amazi has been very fortunate to have uh, very supportive investors. As you know, our lead investors are Sutter Hill Ventures, Clear Ventures, and Warden International. Mm -hmm. And all of them have been very supportive to us in helping us grow, uh, providing uh, financial support, which is important, but in addition, bringing their experience and their vision and helping the team to merge together to see how we can run a successful business that makes a difference in the industry. So from that point of view, we've been very fortunate. And uh, sort of from the finance side, as you mentioned, that we've been, we have raised just uh, over hundred million so far. And, uh, and uh, as we grow towards uh, 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 profitability, we will be, we'll be raising another round of it, uh, perhaps later this year. So, so, so with, with that in mind, uh, we, we also are building partnership along the way with uh, various companies. So uh, the one that we announced publicly, I guess, uh, is uh, UEI, which is on the remote control side. They make a lot mm -hmm. of the high-end remote controls in the, in, in the business. They are the leading provider of the high-end remote uh, solution. So, so that, that, that will help enable our solution with energy harvesting to get into a lot of the uh, carrier market, the uh, service provider market uh, throughout the world. So that, that to me is very exciting and, uh, and meaningful in many cases. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and so we are continuing to grow our partnership across in various sectors. Outstanding. Dude, what, um, obviously, you know, you spent, um, you know, a, a lot of your time sort of in the, the electrical engineering uh, space and learning the, your trade as, as you grew and, and, you, uh, and you developed your career. Um, for sort of the, the next generation that is going to be listening and, and watching this show, um, obviously, you know, this, this, this is, is an extremely hot area that is going to continue uh, over the coming years. What, what are you looking at for the next generation? Are you looking uh, for electrical engineers? Uh, what other sort of technological uh, expertise are you looking for for the company? And, you know, obviously you're, you're going to be growing the staff, uh, other skill sets, uh, things you might want to say to that next uh, graduate that's going to be listening to the show that wants to come work with Dr. David Sue or <laughs> be part of your team. Um, Say a few words there, if you would. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. As you know, for a startup company, we're going through various phases. We're now at this expansion phase because there's so much to do. Yeah. And uh, we do have uh, very supportive investors. So, so investment is not the challenge. It's growing the team in a uh, sustainable manner. Yep. And uh, so, so hiring-wise, definitely, we, we are looking for talent all the way across. The way I look at it is good talent is always hard to find. Uh, and and uh, hiring people is easy, but hiring good people is never easy. And and so across the board, uh, we we as you know, we we do circuit level work, we do system level work, we do software level work that runs on top of it. So th so this is because we are a system on a chip. That means that well, our work is not done until we have a complete working solution that includes most of work actually is software. Uh, and, uh, and then there's a fair amount of hardware that goes below it as well. So, so I, I think someone else made this comment a while back that a chip company is just a software company in disguise. <laughs> uh, so, so but, but, but with that said, we, we need talent all the way across. For young people, uh, I had the, 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 uh, the uh, fortune to work with a lot of very smart young people over the years, both at my, uh, as part of a company work, as well as a university work as well. My, my general sense for, for everybody essentially is that you, uh, people say follow your passion. I, I will almost say stretch yourself. Mm -hmm. do, do what you believe is meaningful and don't be afraid to do just a little bit more than you normally think you can do because you never know what you can truly do until you are willing to uh, stretch beyond what your comfort zone is. In fact, for young people, if you are very comfortable doing what you're doing, I would say, unless you are ready to retire, stretch, do more. There's always more and, and uh, you will learn more. And yes, not everything will work out, but 
it's how you build a career that is meaningful to yourself. Because, because the, the goal I think most of us should have essentially is that as you look towards retirement with, uh, what are you gonna, how are you gonna tell your grandkids what you did is meaningful? So, so don't lose the opportunity because it takes a lifetime to build up what is meaningful. So for young people, uh, you have the war ahead of you. Uh, stretch, do, do what you can to make your life impactful and work with smart people, things you enjoy doing and uh, do more. That, 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 that'll, be, that'll be the, the three things I would encourage young people to do. And, and, and clearly, yeah, uh, we are looking for, for, for new talent as well. Outstanding. A great message as well. It's, it's um, for, for someone like myself, coming out of the healthcare space, but this is truly fascinating um, listening to what you're built here, David. And I just, um, I, I'm going to be exciting to keep following you uh, and the company and, and really wishing you uh, the best uh, as you continue to grow it because it, it is so groundbreaking and a so whole, holy grailish uh, to someone like myself. So I, I, I'm excited for you. Um, for, for everybody that's going to be listening uh, to this particular episode across the different podcast networks uh, or watching on the YouTube channel, uh, you've been listening to Dr. David Sue. Chief Executive Officer and co-founder of Atmosic, re-architecting wireless connectivity, totally making batteries last forever, making IoT battery-free. Uh, really exciting times uh, for both him and the company. Um, David, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to, to talk to us and educate us for a little while here. Uh, obviously, thank you for everything you're doing there. And as we say on this show, thanks for helping to create a better tomorrow through what you're developing. A really very fascinating story. Thank you.